ensemble. Marching band, I, would, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, great, absolutely. Um, and do check our, our website because uh, periodically we do post um, these little excerpts, especially from the wind ensemble, and um, there'll, there'll be more coming in the, in the winter term as well. So um, just to say the relationships that are built in our uh, cohorts of ensembles are even more important now as, as uh, we're all isolated and um, still working to bring great, great moments uh, together. And as a community, Dartmouth, as you all know, is, some, is a community that sticks together. But you know, there's something about going through a period like this together that I think will make this year even more, 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 more bounding, binding, more special. Um, the Hop at Home has been a platform for, the, for the, these elements that have come out of the terms length of work with our ensembles, but it's also been a place for our members to be meeting and gathering. And I, and I see a number of our members as part of this group. Um, we will be continuing that programming and we'll be announcing more of uh, what's going to be happening in the winter term right after the new year. And we'll likely be able to uh, uh, stay in that realm through the winter, maybe into the spring. Um, I, I think we're really looking forward to a summer of joy outside and maybe gathering. But for now, um, Hop at Home is our space for programming and gathering. And if you aren't members yet, um, you know, we certainly would appreciate your membership. It's a great way to come to the party. We've had a number of members events with artists and um, jewelry making studios and activities and there'll be more to come in the winter. Uh, and frankly, uh, you know, a uh, uh, membership is kind of like a Netflix subscription really in terms of uh, cost. So, and Netflix may provide good content, but it's not an opportunity to drink with your friends. So please consider doing that. Um, if it wasn't a busy, busy enough term, um, figuring out what the Hopkins Center role might be in uh, this virtual space, um, we also were very busy in uh, thinking about the Hop project. And um, many of you have heard for a number of years now that the Hop Crop Project, in terms of the expansion and reconception and renewal of the Hopkins Center would be underway. Well, I'm happy to say that in, in this time, um, we have been working hard on the Hop Project and there'll be an announcement right after the new year of appointment of architects and uh, a timeline for that. But I, you're, you're very close to us. You're our Upper Valley Club. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been thinking about and uh, talking with our campus planning team about. Um, the Hopkins Center, as you know, um, was an extraordinary uh, building. Um, it was, uh, it defined a new trend in performing arts centers when it came on online in 1962. And in many ways, it's time for the Hopkins Center to step up and be extraordinary in this new world, because we've learned a lot about what it means to be connected beyond actually being in a physical space together. And that has been one of the silver linings. We've been able to keep all of our Upper Valley community together, but we've also been able to keep our Dartmouth community more widely together. Um, students, as they've been working and learning remotely from all around the world, have continued to participate in HOP events. Um, members from all around the country and the world have been able to gather and we would like very much to continue to find a way for our live events in the future to live alongside of a more robust uh, digital life for those who may not be able to travel at all the time to the Hopkins Center. 
So what that what does that mean? Well, it means that we've always known that a 21st century perspective in the Hopkins Center was going to be important to its future, but now more than ever, how we create the digital platforms and the connectivity that allow us to bring the world to the hop, even when we physically can't do that, either because of a time like this or because people are very, very far away. And how do we synthesize that and bring that into the lives of our students such that we can project out and make things that are joyful and that are informative and reflective of the world around us. So I know um, Walt will have a lot to offer uh, on this topic because it's been a challenging time for us all, um, not just in terms of the pandemic, but in terms of the um, heartbreak around some of the racial disparities and, and racial violence that we've seen in the country. So many things that we have an opportunity to help people heal and come together around. And that's really what the role of the arts are. So a um, couple of features of the HOP project that we'll be focused on, first of all, um, the accessibility of the building itself. We recognize that much of the building was built at a time when accessibility was not um, thought about, but having a welcoming uh, front door that allows for an entry that is not only grand, but is accessible and is a, a, a new place for gathering. Um, gathering spaces that reach beyond uh, just the cafe and the top of the hop, although a renewed and renovated top of the hop that has all of the infrastructure that will allow us to gather uh, is going to be an important part of a new hop project. And then ultimately how we create. And we're currently looking at adding um, some new facilities in the Hopkins Center that allow for us to create in a very 21st century way in a kind of, um, if you could think about uh, uh, a Bentley uh, 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 theater on uh, steroids with all of the technology and equipment that allows us to create in a black box environment and uh, not only create for the audience in the room, but, but also for the world at large. And then some beautiful and useful recital spaces for our larger classrooms for to accommodate class classes and demand for classes that currently are being um, put it uh, turned away. Also uh, for our larger ensemble performances and practice rooms when we come together and we can actually perform again as ensembles is gonna be an important part of what we do. So essentially, um, the, the project has three elements. It's, it, it's, its goals are to impact how we welcome people, to impact the spaces that we gather in so that we can all be together in a way that is more meaningful and, uh, and social, and how we create, how we, how we create both in terms of teaching as well as uh, bringing visiting artists together with our community and really transform our, our community through the work that we create together and project out into the world. We will also be having to do this over the course of probably two phases of, of work. Um, and the campus is also coming to a time when um, it's, commissioned and resolving a master plan for the, for the entire campus. And so has uh, uh, charged us with developing also a district plan that allows us to think about how we actually uh, relate to the investments uh, in the arts at Dartmouth, which includes not only a renewed and expanded Hopkins Center, but obviously a renewed Hood Museum um, and uh, the Black Family Visual Arts Center and all of what's around it and what will be planned as part of uh, the larger master plan that will uh, be, in, be implemented across a horizon of probably up to 10 years. So the fact that the college is thinking expansively about the arts and how important it is 
to our community, to our students, to our faculty, and, and to all of the artists who visit from around the world is so encouraging. And I would, I would just uh, um, say that whatever ends up uh, in phase one versus phase two, we will be uh, doing as much as we can to renew spaces like Spalding, who is that um, you know needs some basic infrastructure in order to be useful for the next five to ten years and uh, and more. So I know many of you are involved in OSHA and other initiatives. This the construction is not happening this summer. Um, it it, it we're, our greatest aspiration for this summer is to be able to gather joyfully and have some programming that we can all share with our masks on safely. Um, and I I would venture to guess that. Uh, you know, probably uh, Spalding will be in the near future, but not, you know, immediate future, but we will certainly be keeping OSHA in mind and all the others who use um, and rely on Spalding as its living room. So before we get to uh, Walt, I just thought I'd pause there and just see if anybody has any questions uh, or reflections or, uh, anything about uh, what we've been doing either through HOP at Home or with our ensembles or in this larger um, HOP project. To say that COVID isolation has been a quiet time at the Hopkins Center would be uh, a real uh, fib. Um, so we've been, we've been very busy. Um, so there's, there's so much going on. Um, anyone have any uh, questions about what we've been doing? Okay, well, um, with that, I want to um, just say a few words about uh, our uh, our colleague who's here with us. Um, first, I want to thank um, Sherry Fiore, who uh, has been a, a regular uh, a regular person and and host of our members' events who is always joyful and always helping us pull these uh, kinds of things together. So I'm gonna ask everybody to give Sherry a little bit of a happy holiday round of applause for all of her help and assistance, not just tonight, but always and throughout, um, throughout our time together. Um, and then I wanna move to uh, someone who really doesn't need any introduction from me. You've known him for many years and you know his commitment to the students in this community, but I did want to say that um, uh, Walt has uh, been an inspiration to all of us, um, not just because he's been innovative in how he's been keeping our ensembles together, but he's been part of a, a very active dialogue on campus about how we create a, a more inclusive and just world. And um, whether that's at the Hopkins Center or through any of his new teaching that he's doing at, in the music department, or just as a, uh, a, a warm and embraceive uh, person who reminds us that the world has possibilities, we're really always thankful to have Walt with us, but uh, particularly this year as we've all been navigating um, so much. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Walt and Walt invite you to introduce your students. So take it away. <clears throat> All right, Mary Lou, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Okay. Well, first of all, um, I bring you greetings from Chicagoland. Um, I've been here throughout the uh, pandemic. I've come out uh, to the Upper Valley a few times. But um, like Mary Lou said, I've been virtual. I have not seen a student face to face, um, but I've definitely engaged with them. As Mary Lou said, uh, um, we clearly have been busy. In fact, Mary Lou, if I may say, I've been busier during the pandemic, which, which I never thought that was possible. So first of all, if I may, I want to say greetings to my family. You guys are like family to me. I, um, I, I'm in my 18th year here. I've never done anything for 18 years. Um, 
So this has been the part of my adult life. Um, and uh, so when I see many of you, I really feel I'm looking at family, and, I, and I've seen many of you the years. Uh, allow me, if I can, Jenny, can I adopt you as my, um, as my mama um, out there? Absolutely. I, I read your lips. I will take that. Y'all, Jenny takes care of me um, in so many ways. Um, I will never forget. Um, you gave me a gift, Jenny. It was a concert that we had done in Rollins Chapel. And I can always count on Jenny for frank, kind, but accurate feedback. And uh, she came up to me and says, Walt, I really enjoyed your performance. But I must tell you, in Rollins, I had difficulty understanding you. And I said, Jenny, thank you for being kind enough to tell me. Because that year we had done four different concerts in Rollins. And that was the first of four. And I'm so grateful that Jenny had the um, uh, willingness to come up and just g give what I call courageously candid conversation. And uh, that's an alliteration I love to use. So, Jenny, thank you. But again, it's so good to see you all. As Mary Lou said, um, we have clearly been connected, and I'm so privileged to have two students with me. I have Katie McCarthy. Wave, Katie, for everyone. Katie's a 23 from Massachusetts. All right, Katie. And then I've got John Ijiogu. Wave, John, over there. John is also a 23, and he's from Nigeria. And so I'm so grateful for these two uh, to, to join me to give a little insight as to what it's been like to, to be part of the ensemble experience, albeit in a virtual application. Um, but before I bring them to the, 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 the virtual stage and, and let them give you a little insight, I want to just give you a little bit of insight to kind of the way we've been navigating with my colleagues. Um, I think I've got the world's best colleagues, whether it's Taylor um, with Barbary Coast, with the Coast. We've got Filippo, of course, with DSO, and also hanging, uh, keeping the reins of the Glee Club in handle. We've got John Higginbotham as our wonderful, extraordinary uh, dance man. And then you saw the work from Brian Messier, who just does some amazing things under the leadership of Joshua Price Cole. And with um, a person on, at his side, Karina, we are this this ragtag group of folks that bring so many various abilities and gifts and perspectives to the table. And we've all applied that as we've navigated our reality in this virtual world. So one of the things I want you to know is that a couple of things that I think Mary Lou made reference to is the biggest takeaway from the virtual is it's not so much about getting together and creating music arts, performance, what have you. Yes, we've tried to do that, and we've clearly learned that in a virtual world, there are some challenges to doing so. The biggest thing has been about connectivity. And, and you know, when I turn it over to students, they'll give you some insight to that. We've learned that if for any reason, just gathering together, looking at each other, talking to each other, hearing about what, how do you feel? What are you going through? You know, and what do you miss? And just being a place to be able to look at people's faces and do that. And so the connectivity has been um, a, a clear aspect. But there have been some other side benefits, believe it or not, from being virtual. One of which is my students and the recent alums have really risen to leadership levels that you would have never imagined would have happened. Why is that? When you look at being in a virtual environment, oftentimes we have to share the wealth in being able to lead an ensemble. So whether that's in routine communication aspects, whether it's in gathering in the virtual environment and conducting rehearsals, as you know, Zoom has breakout room capabilities. On occasion, we've gone and we've done sectionals and breakouts. And I mean, omnipresent is not one of the gifts that any of us have. So oftentimes we have to be able to utilize students and, and, and graduates to be able to lead in the breakout rooms. And then I think also leadership comes in different capacities of just checking in with each other, you know, and ways to, of what that looks like. And so the students and alums have um, really risen to great leadership. But the another benefit has been, so if you think about, particularly in the gospel choir, one thing I've embraced is that the gospel choir is a combination of five constituencies, students, which are most important, alumni, the Upper Valley community, faculty and staff, and then our professional um, mentor network. Well, in the past, an alum would graduate and they could not stay, take part because rehearsals are happening. How would they do that? I will tell you, the virtual world has brought alums out of the woodwork. 
And it's been amazing. I mean, I, I've connected. Uh, one of the projects I'm going to show you, you're going to see that we've got alumni involved. And one of the gentlemen in the project is actually my first class from 18 years back. So um, connecting with these different constituencies has been a wonderful, wonderful byproduct. Another aspect that's been amazing has been the collaboration that happens amongst each other. Um, you know, Brian Messi and uh, Filippo did this wonderful, I'm sorry, Brian and uh, John Higginbotham, uh, Syncopated Clock. And that was a collaborative effort where they were able to come together, take both of their students and be a part. What we've learned is that together we can do more. We realize that while we may not be able to give students uh, the typical experience of being in the room, that doesn't mean we can't give them and have them be a part of a collective effort. And so I'm just so grateful that we've been able to work collaboratively in that way. So that's been some of the side benefits of the virtual world. But what I'm going to do is, you've heard enough from me, I'm going to ask Katie and John to unmute themselves and say hi to the group if you would, starting with Katie and then John. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Katie, as you can see on the screen below me. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm currently in Massachusetts, my home. Um, I've been home since March. Um, at the end of winter term, we were sent home, um, and I wasn't on campus in the fall. Um, I don't know how long I'm supposed to go on this, um, but, <laughs> I, yeah. but um, I joined gospel choir um, fall term of my freshman year, and I've stuck with it ever since, and I've been incredibly grateful to still have this group to connect with even as everything is very not set in stone um, in every other part of life. So, Katie, great, great. great. You know, it's funny. I, I was going to ask Katie and she started to go into that detail about kind of what is it meant to continue to gather? And she, you gave us some insight. Katie, I'm going to come back to you and let you elaborate, but I'm going to ask John to greet the groom. John, are you there? Yes, I see you over here. I am here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Ijugu and um, I'm from Nigeria. I have been on campus over the course of the, um, the pandemic. So I came here last year, September, and I haven't gone home since then. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I need to elaborate more on what the gospel choir has been for me right now, or if I should talk about that later. Well, John, you know, you really went there, and I, I like that. First of all, you guys, I shared with the group yesterday, um, John, and like Katie said, he hasn't, Katie hasn't been on campus, but John, unfortunately, many of our international students, and I, I bring this to your attention so that you can be mindful of this, so many of them, unfortunately, based on safety concerns and CDC regulations and travel restrictions, have not been able to go home. John is one of those. Um, John came to us at the age of 17, and I met him his first term. And uh, I, I just, I, I'm in such awe of both of these students here, you know, but particularly my heart goes out to John because um, he won't be able to go home. But John, I tell him he's got family with the gospel choir and he's got family in the Upper Valley. And so, John, I thank you for sharing that. And with that in mind, John, I'm going to ask you first and then, Katie, I'm going to come back to you. So, John, you've had a chance to be on campus both pre-COVID, during COVID. And I guess my question to you is, in an attempt to keep your sound mind, body and soul, what has participating in virtual projects, whether they be projects with the gospel choir or projects with the other um, pop ensemble efforts, what has that meant to you? Okay, um, well, like, like Walt said, I haven't been able to go back home since I came here. So uh, imagine traveling to a different country, you know, trying to get used to the culture for the first few months. And just when you think you're getting the hang of things, everything changes. Right, right. That was basically like the case for me. Uh, and one of the things that I actually got used to, uh, the thing, one thing that actually helped me transit properly into darkness was the gospel choir. So when the pandemic hit, uh, a part of me was worried that I won't be able to, you know, connect with this uh, amazing people and family that I found. But um, the reverse has actually been the case. Uh, the virtual projects have allowed me to, you know, um, connect with multiple people within the within the gospel choir. I don't need to walk anywhere. All I need to do is like hop on Zoom and, you know, talk to people. Uh, uh, I'm still able to do certain vocal recording projects. So yeah, uh, even before the pandemic and during the pandemic, the the gospel choir has like given me, I'd say, I'd say a space to be able to remain sane. Yeah, and um, actually uh, getting involved in multiple things that uh, have helped my life through for a dirt myth. 
Thank you, John. And Katie, I want to come back to you because I know um, as you started going to, what has it meant to be able to still connect with the choir? What has it felt like to you? Definitely. Um, And something that I think I was just thinking about is that a lot of the kind of casual interactions that you get with people just aren't happening anymore just because you're not really, if you go to a Zoom meeting, you're there for the purpose of the meeting and then you leave. Um, If you're going to class, you'll get there on time. You don't have that kind of conversation once you sit down in class with your classmates sitting around you. Um, And that's something that I've really found myself missing because you don't get to have those little conversations with people. Um, And that's definitely been something that I've gotten through these gospel choir meetings, Um, particularly the one at the beginning of this fall. We um, hadn't, I don't think we had like really met over the summer, although like the, we have a group chat, so like that's always active. Um, But it was just a really incredible group. It was like Walt said, um, alumni from all over the country, all over the world um, and students and people in the community And everyone just kind of gave an update on how they were doing. And it's just, that's the kind of connection that you get um, along with the music. Like that's what brought me to join it. But kind of the community is like what makes you really, really want to come back because you want to spend more time with these people. Um, And that's been a really nice thing to have, um, especially in a time where you're not really going out and meeting people anymore. Thank you, Katie. And, And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, it's been that feeling for me too. You know, I think we're all um, remote and, and, and adhering to quarantine, but I tell the students that while we have to be socially distanced, it doesn't mean that we have to be emotionally disconnected. And so I think the reality is we take these opportunities to just be able to engage and, and meet with one another. And so I couldn't have said it better than Katie and John, so I thank you both for that. Um, w- what I wanna do is, as Katie mentioned, there is music that we do produce. And so we've been part of the production of a lot of the virtual projects. Uh, The Gospel Choir, we've been kind of a little bit virtual since of my commuting back and forth. So our transition to this virtual world was kind of, um, we were in a place where we were able to do it pretty uh, uh, seamlessly. And so uh, we had the privilege of producing all of the end of year uh, virtual projects that related to the conferral of degrees or the commencement program, as well as the baccalaureate program. And I could not have done it without the students um, and without the, the community and without the alumni involvement. And you'll kind of see in this project. Before I go into it, I want to see, do you guys have any questions of my students or any questions of me before I share in some of the virtual projects that we've done? And I can't, um, I'll have Sherry help me just in case because I can't see the second page as well. So, just wait. Everybody, you're muted if you want to speak. Okay, was there any, was there a question? I am actually going to ask a question. Please. Well, we had this discussion at, uh, at the top of the hop thing, and you were so pleased to be a New Hampshire voter. Who did, in the primary, who did you end up voting for? I, I, am, I, am, I, am I supposed to vote? <laughs> Oh, you don't have to say. It can well, be a secret vote. I, I will tell you, it was a secret vote, but I think that you, you I, I'm sure that we all voted similar as far as being, as, as wanting to ensure that the divisiveness was put to an end, which I think, Sue, will be a good transition to one of the products that we're doing, okay? Because I can tell you that, um, um, like I said, I am a New Hampshire voter. I am very happy about that, and I felt that um, in the great city of Chicago, your vote kind of, if you vote a certain way, it's kind of in the mass. So, um, so that being said, I did represent. So, Sue, thank you for inquiring. <laughs> okay. Any other questions at all? Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is, so the virtual production aspect is a lot of work that people don't know. Um, you don't have the luxury of being in the room with the students. So in addition to embracing technology and embracing new hardware, like my mic you see here, Um, students had to navigate the angst associated with, oh my gosh, I'm recording myself and someone's going to listen to me sing. And then we had to navigate camera work and video work and all that kind of thing. So what I want to share with you, what we did is we decided, as Mary Lou said, one of the lenses that I'm always aware of is that of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And diversity, you guys, is powerful. And I think that no one, you know, knows that I've learned, I've had a lesson in diversity since coming to Dartmouth. Um, Being a a man of color from the Midwest, I had a certain um, realizations and certain expectations of what it meant to produce gospel music. And that paradigm shift happened um, 
abundantly clear when I came to Dartmouth. So um, in the spirit of diversity, I told, I asked the students in my membership, I said, hey, can we do a kind of a multicultural holiday uh, presentation to celebrate the various holidays? Um, we know um, Hanukkah, which happy Hanukkah to those who celebrate Hanukkah. Um, but also we've got, um, there's a holiday called Three Kings, which is in the, um, the Hispanic culture. There's um, Christmas. And then Kwanzaa. So what I want, and, and, and many others, and many others. But we embraced those. And so I want to give you just a, just a snippet and transparency time to all you all. Like Mary Lou, um, this project literally finished being edited at 428. <laughs> and it, it's rough. But you're my family. So I'm going to tell you right now, I trust my family. I, for those of you who know me, I am a control freak. What I'm about to do, Mary Lou, is I, I, I haven't even watched this video the entire way through. So I'm going to be watching it with you. I want to let you know this is the rough. So for those of you recording, um, and what this is, is basically it's a compilation into three of the four songs. Um, I had the privilege of not only reaching out to the gospel choir, but in the spirit of collaboration, I reached out to the Glee Club. I reached out to the Hamlet Society. I reached out to the football team, reached out to the Jewish community. We reached out to anybody who said they'd be a part. So what you're about to see <laughs> is um, the first song is Celebrating Three Kings with Three Kings, um, the song Three Kings. The second one is called Hanukkah or Hanukkah. And the third one is God Rest You Married Gentlemen. And like I said, it's, it's the first edit. So um, stay tuned. Um, when we show you these uh, videos, I want you to know that what's going to happen is the finished versions are going to be complete in the days to follow. So family, here it is. I'm going to uh, share my screen. So let me first of all get it set. Okay, let me share my screen. Tell me if you're able to see, you should see some people. Okay. Do you see uh, some images there? You do? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> here goes.
<laughs> okay, no major catastrophe there. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> okay, um, so what I wanted to do before I uh, leave you all, so as Mary Lou mentioned, um, one of the things that we did is with the gospel choir, we decided to embrace some messaging as I always try to do. And so one of the things I wanted to do, and I'm going to pull up um, in this time, and I can tell you if I can just, if you can indulge me for a minute, um, obviously there's been a lot of things that have happening um, when it comes to the injustices and, and, and equity around uh, underserved communities, whether those be communities um, of color, whether they be social disadvantaged people, whether it be women, whether it be LGBT, um, immigrant communities, there's been a lot of this. And particularly, uh, this is near and dear to my heart as a Chicagoan. Um, what many of you may not know is I live smack dab downtown. And when the riots were happening, I could look out my living room window and see them because they were coming down my street. In fact, um, the property that I lived in, um, unfortunately, experienced some looting. And, and at that time, I, at first I was, you know, just really just up in arms and said, what's going on? And then I realized the saying of Maya Angelou, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people of the contract that perhaps should happen has maybe not been fulfilled. And, and, and that's what, in essence, you're hearing. And so I shared with Mary Lou that I felt the need to be able to take this wonderful platform that I've been blessed with at Dartmouth to do more and to be impactful and intentional with the work that we do around activism. And so I shared with all the groups under my purview that what I wanted to do was embrace some messaging. So in this particular term, I said, let's embrace the subject of healing. And so basically what happened was, um, I'm gonna show you, uh, so we did two videos. I, I wrote two songs. One is called, We Need That Healing. The second is called, Heal the USA. And so in keeping, I'll let you into this. Um, I'm gonna submit and release this video in the next few days, and I'm gonna send it to the Biden team with hopes that um, in fact, and if any of you all know anyone within that camp, um, I don't know if you remember, 12 years ago, I took 91 people to sing at Barack Obama's opening inaugural event. I'm hoping that when they see this effort, they're gonna say, let's make a revisit and have Dartmouth be part of this uh, particular effort. So that's my hopes and prayers we share this with you. So as you watch this, know that what we've got involved is we've got graduates, we've got Upper Valley people. In that last video, you saw that as well. I've got faculty members um, and, and this whole effort. So this was an effort particularly around the Kenosha um, incident where Jacob Blake was shot seven times. What, where I was moved to do healing was this opening clip that you're about to see. This was his mother who came, and when she says, am I praying for healing for my son? She says, absolutely, but equally, I'm praying for healing for the policeman's family. I'm praying for healing of our community, and I'm praying for healing of our country. And I was moved, everyone, because when I saw that this individual whose son was shot seven times, could look beyond her circumstances and her situation and recognize that on a greater scale that there was a need for healing, I was moved to be able to embrace that message of healing as well. So that's what led to our topic. And so I'm gonna play for this. This is just, uh, it's, it's, this is a snippet of the two videos that will be released in the days to follow. And when you release it, help me make this go video, uh, make it go viral. And I'm going to open this video. Um, it's called the DCGC Healing Snippets. Okay. So I'm going to, oops. Is my Zoom still there? Did I lose my Zoom? Oh, is my Zoom still there? You're there. Okay, I was looking, I'm like, wait a minute, what happened? So do we all see the lovely Jenia? <laughs> Hi, Jenia. Hell the world. Okay. Isn't that a beautiful image, everyone? Uh, okay, here it goes. 
Enjoy the Healy snippet. Here goes. As I pray for my son's healing, I also have been praying even before this for the healing of our country. People across the world need healing. Emotional, physical, financial healing. And we need it now. We need that healing, but we don't know how. Black, white, or brown, let's come together, take a stand and shout. Because the truth is, the healing will come, but only if we unite as one. So in the words of Dr. King, the time is always right. To do the right thing, let's heal. We need that healing. We need that healing. That's a teaser. Lovely. So stay tuned for those videos. We're going to be releasing those. Um, I, like I said, the, the one subject I'll leave you with was Heal the USA. And I think I told my students and I share with you all, um, it's very easy to to um, to, to get, reflect about election results and everything. And I told everyone, you know, I'm sure many folks and I told my students, I think many of them at Dartmouth, we were hoping for a blue tidal wave. And I said, folks, I said, you know something? I think that it's easy to sit there and say, wow, let's get every places and everyone in office and, and, and they'll make all the decisions and they'll fix everything. And I said, I had to look inside too and realize it's going to take all of us. And it's everything. And, and, and reality is, is through this healing and uniting, whether you're on the left or the right, from the bottom to the top, from the inside out, it's this collective effort together that we can all make a difference. And so as the song says, and I'm proud to say I serve mankind. It's the calling I can choose to use. And so we need to use our gifts, talents, and times to make a difference. And so that's the nature of, of the healing. So I thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mary Lou, for having me be a part. I thank Katie and John for joining us and for their continued involvement in the effort. And uh, that, Mary Lou, with that, I'm going to put it back in your hands. If there's any questions, I'm here to answer any questions. Well, you know, as always, um, the work that you're doing is so moving and, uh, you know, sets the stage for such hopefulness, right? Like that's what this is really about. And I think it's, uh, it's so unique. It's truly uniquely a Dartmouth um, way of being, that there is hope in the world, that there are solutions, that, you know, yes, things are tough, but you can move forward. And um, I, 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 you know, if I were going to find myself in a situation uh, for nine months like this, there's no uh, more encouraging community to be a part of. And I, I just want to thank you, thank our students, thank all of you on this call who have become um, my neighbors and my friends over the course of these slightly more than three years. And um, I want you to know that uh, we keep going. And one of the ways we keep going, I, I have to say, Walt, can you say anything about what you're hoping for for Dartmouth Idol in the coming um, term? Because I know that that's something we all look forward to. Sure. Um, Dartmouth Idol is going to be alive and well. It's going to be virtual. Um, we're going to embrace, to Mary Lou's point, this is our reality. And so we're going to make it be um, um, worth all the time. We've got the audition rounds that are happening as we speak. Matter of fact, the two individuals on this Zoom, Katie and John, are um, potential Dartmouth Idol 
um, people. So we're basically doing the same thing. On January 9th is going to be the semifinals. And like before, you have a chance to be involved. The difference is it'll be a Zoom event that'll be premiered on YouTube that'll stay live for like almost five, six days. And so what happens is if you can't watch it in the time, don't worry about it. Watch it another time. And then you get to vote throughout that period and you'll be part of that. And then the other ch difference is going to be that the idol finals, you know how often we unfortunately have to turn people away? Well, guess what? In a virtual world, no turning anyone away. And so everyone gets a chance to be able to see it and you get the best seat, your living room or your office or whatever you watch. And it's gonna be episodic this year, which um, was a suggestion from Mary Lou, which I, I love it because what gets to happen is it's gonna be an iteration of three different episodes. And so we wanted to make it to where you can participate and see your different idols. They'll be in all three episodes, but we'll highlight, like there's six idol finalists, Episode one will highlight finalists one and two. Episode three will highlight finalists three and four and, and so on. So I'm excited about that. And I'm very hopeful that as before, IDO is a tool for uniting the campus for the first time. And Mary Lou, I don't know if you even know this. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, we're expanding IDO beyond the undergraduate ranks. Were you aware of that? Did I, Joshua tell no, you? No, I'm not sure I did know that, but I'm glad okay. to hear it. Okay, so what we decided to do, and forgive me, Mary, for throwing that at you, but Joshua and I discussed it. He said you'd be fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. If not, well, so what's happening is um, for the first time, you all, we are inviting all the graduate schools. And so we sent out communication because guess what? They need to be connected to. Absolutely. And so I said, why not use this as a time? So we're reaching out to Geisel, to Thayer, to tuck to all those in hopes to be able to involve them. And I'm hoping that by doing that, we'll get more of them to tune in to this wonderful world because artistry has a way of connecting like nothing else. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, no, thanks so much for sharing that, Walt. And, you know, honestly, uh, we have uh, the largest cohort of HOP fellows this year, uh, and two of them are graduate students. So uh, you, thank you all for bringing us together so Walt could, Walt and I could kibitz and, and share some information <laughs> that we otherwise would probably not think to share with each other. Um, with that, I, I, I want to thank you, Jenia, for inviting all of us. This has been a real treat for us and, a, and, and I have to say a real way to, for us to kick off the holidays. We actually go on break on Friday. We're all sort of scrambling to um, say hello and goodbye to all of our friends and get prepared for the winter term. But this has been really just a blessing to be with you all. And, and I wish you all uh, a wonderful, wonderful end of the year and celebration of all the holidays that you may be celebrating. And may we all look in the rearview mirror at 2020 as a very special place to have shared, but not repeat. So. Can I just ask, can I tell Walt something, please? Chris. Walt? Yes, I'm right here. Uh, it's Frank Lesher. Hi, here Frank. In here yeah, we, 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 ran into, we ran into each other in Chicago that time. We, we did, and actually we spent the entire summer in Chicago this year babysitting. But I want to give you the name of Jamal Brown. Jamal was a classmate of my son, Ted, 2010, mm -hmm. on the track team and has a fairly large role in communications for the Biden campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, Frank, I'm so glad you did that because I will tell you that when we participated in the Barack Obama inauguration, it was a Dartmouth connection that ultimately got us connected. So I've always told people that um, Dartmouth not only bleeds green, that they, they bleed far. So, um, so thank you, Frank. I'm gonna definitely do that. You said Jamal Brown. Jamal Brown, and you can find him on Facebook, I'm sure. And, and 2010, you said? 2010. Could have been 2011. I think he was in my son's class, though, 2010. Wonderful. Frank, thank you, and I will definitely follow up with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Merry and Christmas, everyone. Happy, happy holidays, everyone. All right. Okay, so uh, Mary Lou, do, uh, have you wrapped up or would you like to say, any, say anything more? Uh, no, I, I was actually looking for Ginia. She seemed to have uh, uh, leaved her block, but I was just gonna say thank you one more time. And we look forward to sharing 
more in the new year. And uh, we'll see you both in the box and out on the streets at some point in time in 2021, I'm confident. Thank you. Mary Lou, thank you for including us. Thank you. No, absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. So thank you, everyone, for participating. And we got to see a little bit of everything. So that was really great. And um, I took notes. So uh, for those who couldn't attend, then we can share some notes. And we may be able to have some, uh, some video up. And it was nice to see some faces and names that I haven't seen in some of our, uh, some of our uh, meetings before. So even though our attendance is not a thousand people over the course of this year, we've been having, seeing a lot of different people from the alumni body coming and participating in our virtual meetings. Uh, so this has been really interesting and it's been really great to have people that uh, like me have bad eyesight and can't drive out very far at night. <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, it's uh, uh, as what was saying, it's nice to be um, to be more accessible. So it's possible we may have the occasional virtual or find ways to share uh, DCUV content. Um, uh, even once months, months from now, we can meet in person again. Um, but uh, but it was lovely to see some of you. I'm just chattering away as people are, are leaving here. Yeah, we did get to see some people this weekend uh, when we were boxing up our things. So that, that was a lot of fun to actually get to see some other people. And I got to see Greg at uh, uh, this morning when we were taking the boxes up to the Hopkins Center and when it was very cold out and he didn't have a warm enough coat on. So <laughs> see, I got a smile out of him. Uh, so, uh, so that was actually a lot of fun. And I uh, never do. You never do have a warm coat on. Uh, so um, uh, probably in the newsletter, we will uh, report on kind of some of our totals uh, for, the, uh, for the care packages. I don't know whether our, um, uh, one of our student guests tonight was one of the ones that gets the boxes because I don't know if he's on campus or off campus, but if he's a freshman, he probably has been on campus. So um, it will be interesting to know uh, if he was able to take advantage of the packages or if he hasn't been over to the dining hall yet. That would be, uh, be fun to find out what he, he thought of our efforts. Um, so does anyone have anything else they would like to say on our, our holiday gathering here? Am I the only one who noticed the menorah bong in the video? I, I, I was wondering about the, whether that was, I, I thought it was just an oil lamp myself. I did not think it was a menorah bong. <laughs> no, I actually Googled it. There's plenty of pictures. It was pretty clear. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what I didn't share with the meeting as a whole was when I, I um, put my foot through the window seat at AD, they've been renovating, but they haven't gotten to every room and every space. And uh, there was actually a stash of, of um, uh, liquid refreshment in the, um, in the window seat, which fortunately, yes, he's saying hush, which fortunately my foot did not smash through. So, but I, I alerted the appropriate party and I'm sure it's gone now. So it was very dusty refreshments. But what was not clear was what the hole in the floor was headed to. It was a space underneath the floor. So I don't know what they were keeping in there, but I won't tell their secret and where the, uh, where the spot was because I'm sure it's gonna get repaired. <laughs> so does anyone, uh, I hope you all uh, have a lovely, uh, uh, any of the various holidays we're celebrating. Uh, I'm actually headed this, after, uh, this evening once I sort out my health insurance uh, sign up. Uh, my class is actually having a holiday party at eight o'clock tonight, and we are going to have a trivia contest and an ugly sweater contest. And I'm not sure what it's all going to be up to, but I'm, I've been very pleased that that uh, I get to have two parties in one night, which is a lot of fun. So I'm going to say good night to the Oxman household, the Walden household, the Brown household, the Jones household. Uh, Jean's phone, Alan's iPad, Sean and Greg. <laughs> so have, have various happy holidays. Good night, everybody. Good night.